bless you, Hannah. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy New Year. The weeks following Christmas, we hope you had a wonderful summer yesterday. And we're back to, I think, six to ten inches of snow last reported. Tomorrow, I know the teenagers might be excited. Parents, I'm sorry, but your kids might be home tomorrow. I have a 15-year-old yeah, also. Lord, please bring the spring weather again. <laughs> we're continuing our Restore Me mini-series today with a sermon titled, Your Life Hidden in Christ. Your Life Hidden in Christ. And I just want to take a minute and I just want to offer uh, my sincere thanks to Pastor Michael uh, for giving me the opportunity to just be up on the podium today and sharing with you God's word. Pastor Michael and Bonnie and his family, they took the day off today just to relax and just spend some time together as a family. Last week, Pastor Michael shared about seeking God and praying to him for a word for 2022. And I just, uh, I, I hope that you've been, you've been praying and the Lord has been speaking to you. Next week, Pastor Craig will be concluding our little mini-series. And then I believe it's on the 16th, Pastor Michael will be launching the new series. You don't want to miss that. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And I want to take a moment, and I just want to say this from, from my heart. If you don't own your own Bible, we want to give you one. If you don't own your own Bible, we, we, want to put, we want to put one in your hands. And the reason we want to do that is because we know the importance of God's word. If, if you would just after the service, come see myself or Pastor Craig, you go to the connections table and we will make sure that we put one in your hand. And if you do have a Bible, we want you to bring it each and every week to church. And the reason is, is we want you to be reading along. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. And I know sometimes we really don't want the word of God to judge our thoughts and our attitudes, but let me tell you, it's, it's refreshing when it does. Reading the Bible is one way that the Lord can speak to you. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the Lord speaks through the word of God? He does. And if anything else, for no other reason, like Michael says, that you never know the kind of, and he's in his English accent, the kind of rubbish that's going to come out of my mouth. Well, I'll tell you right now, you don't know what's going to come out of my mouth either. So let's just, uh, let's read right now. Colossians chapter 3. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 17. It says this. So you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds... Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We'll come back to that. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, since you have, been, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Highlight that. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anybody has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Verse 15, and let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks 
to God the Father through him. Father God, I just want to pause and pray right now, Lord, that your words would be the ones that are coming out of my mouth. Lord, if I have any opinions or agenda, I pray that you would just silence me and that still your word would just come forth, Lord. And when your word goes forth, I pray that the people here, they would receive it in their hearts and their minds. Lord, you know us. You seek our hearts, Lord. And in this moment, we just seek to know you more. And we just want to pray this in your son's name. Amen. The earliest recorded observance of a new year dates back some 4,000 years ago to ancient Babylon. For the Babylonians, the first new moon, I'm sorry, the first new moon following the vernal equinox started the new year. They marked the occasion with a massive religious festival. It was during this time that the new king was crowned or the ruler's divine mandate was symbolically renewed. Throughout antiquity, civilizations around the world developed increasingly sophisticated calendars. However, I'm sorry, uh, and typically pinning the new year to an agricultural or an astronomical event. In Egypt, for instance, the year began with the annual flooding of the Nile. The first day of the Chinese New Year occurred with the second new moon after the winter solstice. In early Roman calendars consisted of 304 days with each new year beginning on the vernal equinox. However, over the centuries, the calendar actually fell out of sync with the sun. And so in 46 BC, the emperor Julius Caesar decided to solve the problem. He consulted with a lot of the prominent mathematicians and astronomers of his time, and he introduced the Julian calendar. As part of his, re as part of his reform, Caesar instituted January 1st, as the first day of the new year. And this was partially due to the pagan god of Janus, and they named it in his namesake. The Romans celebrated by offering sacrifices to Janus, exchanging gifts to one another, and decorating their homes and attending parties. In medieval Europe, Christian leaders temporarily replaced January 1st as the first of the year with days carrying more religious significance, such as December 25th. Pope Gregory XIII reestablished January 1st as the new day, as New Year's Day in 1582. Today, following his namesake, the Gregorian calendar is the most widely used calendar throughout the world. And the practice of making resolutions in this new year is, is thought to actually catch on with the ancient Babylonians 4,000 years ago. And they made promises in order to earn favor from their gods to start the new year off on the right foot. Well, this is no different today. Today, millions of people throughout the world honor about January 1st. They make New Year's resolutions. And the purpose of that is to, to restart or there to be a renewal or a restoration. So I want to play a quick game. It's going to be audience participation time. According to Google, what do we think are the top 10 New Year's resolutions? What do we think? Lose weight, Lose weight exercise. Good health. Good health. Finances. All right, starting from number one, one through ten. Number one, exercise more, lose weight. Who said exercise more? You get a free cup of coffee outside. Lose weight, number two. Number three, get organized, learn a new skill or hobby, live life to the fullest, save more money or spend less money, quit smoking. Number eight, spend more time with family and friends, travel more. And number ten, read more. This morning, in observance of the new year, I just want to take our passage from Colossians chapter 3, and I want to look at a few other verses that have application. And I want to see what the Bible says about resolutions, about being restored, and about being renewed. So Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. And if you're not familiar with who the Apostle Paul is, he was a man formerly known as Saul. And he was part, in his day, he was part of the religious elite that was opposed to Jesus and what Jesus' followers were preaching actually after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, even going as far as killing Christians. One day while Saul was traveling, Jesus met him in a spectacular way, and Jesus commissioned Paul to represent him. This is found in Acts chapter 9, if you, if you want to go back and read it later. Paul was literally blinded for three days. And then by direction from God, a man named Ananias went to Saul, 
Saul was baptized, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then thus began Paul's ministry of preaching, teaching, and planting churches. So Colossians was written later in Paul's ministry, and at this point, he had actually been imprisoned for preaching about Jesus. The book of Colossians is written to a church in Colossae. Paul didn't actually plant the Colossian church. A man named Epaphras did. And it is believed that Epaphras spent about two years with Paul during Paul's ministries, and Epaphras was actually converted by Paul's teachings. Epaphras then brought the good news about Jesus to his hometown of Colossae. Paul visits, I'm sorry, Epaphras visits Paul in prison to deliver the news about the Colossian church, the the Christians in Colossae. And then subsequently, Paul writes a letter to the Colossian church, and this is where we get the book of Colossians. It's where a lot of Paul's writings, Paul wrote most of the New Testament and all of the books of the Bible that Paul wrote, they're actually letters that Paul wrote to the churches. So for the Colossians, Paul is overall, he is addressing the fact that there is false teachings in Colossae. He's arguing against all the ideologies, the culture in which the Colossians were facing. See, Colossae was a region that was filled with many different religions and superstitions, such as astrology and uh, Greek and Roman gods, Eastern Gnostic religions. And he is telling them that when the Christian faith is mingled with other faiths, the message of Christ is no longer prominent. He says the, the Colossians saw that there needed to be a gap between them and Christ with what Paul referred to as these earthly things. Paul is writing to them, and he's saying that they have been deceived into believing that Christ was not enough. So Paul's letter could actually be broken into four different parts. The first is the opening where Paul addresses Jesus as the Messiah. The second part is Paul speaks about his suffering in prison for Jesus. Following that, Paul addresses the pressures that the Colossians are facing to turn away from Jesus. And then finally, in chapters 3 and 4, Paul gives them the practical application for living for Jesus. And this this is where we're landing. This is where we find ourselves in Colossians chapter 3. So this morning, uh, what I want to do is I want to take a practical look at the applications that Paul was writing to the church in Colossae. And what I want to do is break that down and, and look at it and apply it to our own lives. And I want to develop three walking points that we can leave with. The more I read the book of Colossians, it's the more I see the similarities between the Colossian church and our church today, and, and frankly, with my life too. But before I start, I just want to be very clear about something. While this is New Year's, this is not specifically a New Year's message. You know, we talk about being restored and renewed and making New Year's resolutions, and this is a good time to do this, but this is applicable any time of the year. This is not just a New Year's message. So if you're taking notes, you can take notes in your bulletin or in your Bible or in a journal. I want you to write this down. Point number one, we find this in verse two. It says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. So the first thing we need to do is we need to define what are the things that are above and what are earthly things. And Paul points them out here. Verse five, it says, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. He goes on in verse 8, but now put away the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language. So we've identified those are, those are the bad things. But what are the good things? What are the things that we should put on? What are the things of above? Verse 12, follow me. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against a brother. This was a struggle of the culture of that day. This was a struggle of the culture that day. And this is also a struggle today. Things have not changed. Romans 12, 
verse 2, Paul also writes Romans. He writes to the church in Rome. He says this, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul also wrote to the Galatian church, the church in Galatia, in chapter 5, verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. Lastly, James writes about this in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He says, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. I had a friend once tell me, and this really rung with me. He said, we sin because sin is fun. There is actually an enticement to sin. I used this word picture last year. I, I spoke about the root of temptation. And James uses the term in, in, in the book of the Bible, the translation I'm reading, drawn away and enticed. Some translations use the term lured away, lured away. If you've ever been fishing, I, I really enjoy fishing. You use a lure to catch fish. You're actually fooling the fish. You're effectively lying to the fish in order to catch it. See, a, a lure is not the real thing. It looks close enough, though, to the real thing, and a lot of times that's how we see the things of the earth. They look innocent enough, but soon enough we're caught, and that's what sin does. Sin attaches itself to our desires. We find ourselves slipping and sinking into the things of this world, and before you know it, sin has its hold, and sin does that. It does that lure. And you can either eat the fake food or you can eat the real thing. Matthew spoke about this. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33. He says, seek first. What does it say? The kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Walking point number one. If you're taking notes, write this down. You need to ask God if you need to refocus your life. Are you focusing on earthly things or things that are above? You need to ask God if you need to refocus your life. Are you focusing on earthly things or things that are above? We need to be on our knees confessing our sins to God and asking him for strength to overcome. 1 John chapter 1, verse 19 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the Colossian church, the people of the Colossian church, they were a group of Christians. They knew Christ and they had taken off. It says they took off the old self and they put on the new self. But the problem was this. They felt that Christ was too far away for them and they had to fill that void. You know, there are many principles in the Bible. There's many stories. There's many examples that are applicable to the church and to us today. And, and personally speaking, I feel like for most of my life, this is where I landed. I felt that Christ was too far away. In his book, Unlocking the Bible, it's a commentary of the Bible. David Pawson says it this way, and I really, I really think this sums it up really good. The believers had lost their imminence of God. In other words, they lost their, their connection with God. Christians believe that God is both transcendent and imminent, meaning that he is both far above us but also near to us. This truth is a paradox. In other words, this statement is seemingly absurd, but it's true. If you forget either side of the paradox, you lose the Christian belief in God. God is both greater than the universe, and he is nearer than us breathing. The Colossian church forgot this, and I really feel that many of us in the church today have forgotten this too. And I, I feel the same way. I don't know if you do. Do you realize that God is the creator and the sustainer of the entire universe, 
But at the same time, he loves you and he is so close to you right now. Do you feel that there is a void between you and God? And if so, do you need to fill the gap with earthly things that bring temporary relief and temporary pleasure? And do you feel the need in your life that you need to set your mind on things that are above and not on earthly things? Point number two. Point number two we find in verse 9 and 10. And it says this. It says, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. To renew is to bring back to its former condition, to replenish or to restore. See, all these words are synonymous. And the word picture here is something that needs fixing. It needs to be made new again. So I'm, a, I'm a hobbyist woodworker. I love woodworking. And I have an affinity for old vintage tools. There's something about the way that a, a vintage tool works and the way the, the gears work and the belts and the drive and the way that, even the way that smells. And one of my cherished tools in my garage is my grandfather's 1952 Sears and Roebuck Craftsman Table Saw. My grandfather bought it brand new in 1952, and when he died, he gave it to my father, and then my father a few years ago passed it down to me. I, I even have the original instruction manual with it. This year, this table saw is 70 years old, and it runs like a top, but it wasn't without a little bit of restoration. See, when I got it, the motor had begun to wear out. The belts needed tightening. It just overall needed a little bit TLC. And I believe that we're the same way. But here, here's my question. This is kind of what I went searching for. What happened to us that required us to need renewing? What happened to us that required us to have to be made new? And to get the answer to that, we got to go all the way back to Genesis Back to the beginning of the Bible, back to the creation of man. Chapter, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says this. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness, they will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God he created the male and female. And then if you jump down to verse 31, it says, God saw all that he made and it was very good. See, we were created in God's perfect image, but something happened. It's the fall of man. Sin entered man. And I won't read the whole, the whole chapter. It's Genesis chapter three. You can go back and you can read all about the fall of man, about how sin entered the world. But Paul summarizes it in one verse in Romans. Romans chapter 5, verses 12. Paul said this. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people, because all have sinned. So now there's sin in the world. God fulfilled his plan by sending his son Jesus to redeem us. Jesus came, and he died for our sins, and this is the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And scripture tells us that if we declare him as Lord, we will be saved. And that's the gospel. That's the good news. But here's, here's one of the problems that, that we face today. On this side of eternity, there is still sin in this world. And unfortunately, we are not immune to the temptation of sin. I spent a career in the Coast Guard and there's a maritime saying that really helps me understand this. It says this, a ship doesn't sink because of the water around it. A ship sinks because of the water that gets inside of it. Let me say it again. A ship doesn't sink because of the water around it. A ship is surrounded by water. A ship sinks because of the water that gets inside of it. We live in a fallen world and there is sin all around us. And this is what was happening to the Colossian church. One commentator in reference to verses 9 and 10 says this. Paul uses the metaphor of taking off and putting on clothing. 
This suggests that a change of identity has already happened in the life of the believers. It now only remains for them to bring their behavior into line with the new identity. Being renewed, which is in the present tense, being renewed indicates that the transformation of Christians is an ongoing process. So I, I, did, I spent 22 years in the Coast Guard, and prior to me being, by being called into ministry, my plan for retirement was I wanted to go to school and become a chef. I love to cook. It's an outlet for me. I, I, if I, I can have the worst day possible, and I'll stop at the grocery store, I'll go home, and I'll just start cooking. I'll put some music on. My, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but I think deep down inside, she knows that she benefits from that. <laughs> A friend of mine was at the time, he was an executive chef of an upscale restaurant. He's moved around a lot. At the time, this was in Florida. And one time, he actually brought me into his kitchen, his his professional kitchen at the restaurant. And there was a military-like atmosphere in the kitchen. And it's just something that really resonated with me. One of the tools for a chef, arguably the most important tool, is a chef's knife. And a few years ago, I invested in a really good chef's knife. And this year for Christmas, I got a knife sharpening kit. And what it does, what it is, it consists of three stones. Each stone gets progressively smoother. And what you do is you start with the roughest stone, and then you eventually end up at at the smoothest stone. And what you're doing is you're drawing the blade across the stone. And you continually do this, and you're getting progressively smoother. And what happens is you're, at, you're taking off minuscule amounts of steel each time you draw that blade across. You see, when the knife is brand new, it has a factory edge on it. It's razor sharp. But over time, as the chef subjects the knife to its environment, it gradually becomes less sharp. It becomes dull, and it is in need of renewing. The New King James Version says it this way, you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The New Living Translation says it this way, you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become more like him. I really like the way that the NLT puts it. The process of being renewed, you need to, you will learn to know your creator and become more like him. Now what Paul is referring to when he says knowledge or to know, he is not, listen to me, he is not referring to academic knowledge or head knowledge. What Paul is referring to here is heart knowledge. What Paul is referring to here is a heart knowledge. Jeremiah 31, 33 says this, I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. Listen to that. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Listen, I have spoke with many men who feel distant from God because they feel that they lack the head knowledge or the academic knowledge that they feel they need to have a relationship with God. They feel that they lack the head knowledge and the academic knowledge that they feel they need in order to have a relationship with God. This April, my wife and I are celebrating our 18th year together. And each year, thank you, each, each year, I learn more and more about my wife. I didn't have that knowledge when I first met her. Probably a good thing. No, I, I'm sorry, that, she didn't know a lot about me. <laughs> but listen, what happened the day that I met her? Charleston, South Carolina, Olive Garden, April 1st. I walk in <laughs> and I saw her. And my heart wanted to know her. I didn't have the knowledge of her, but my heart bent towards her. And listen, your relationship with Jesus is the exact same way. 
Walking point number two. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down anyway. (laughs) Why would God want to restore you? Because he made you and he wants you to know him. Because he made you and he wants you to know him. I have a good friend that restores furniture. He'll go to antique shops, flea markets, the Habitat for Humanity Restore, and he looks for old furniture to restore. And he'll tell you, you need to look for the right piece. But here's the key. He says, if you find that quote-unquote antique piece that looks like it needs restoration, and it's made out of particle board, and it has a cheap veneer, that's not the stuff. That, that's the trash. What you're looking for is you're looking for the solid wood furniture. You're looking for where the drawers inside are dovetailed. The the fixtures are solid brass. Those are the pieces that are worth restoring. And brother and sister, you're the same way. You were created in God's image. That means that you are worth it. You were made with a purpose. And just like that perfect piece of furniture, you might have a few dings, a few dents, you might have a few scratches on you. And even though sin has made its way into your life, if you let Christ do a work in your life, I I really think that you would be amazed at what Christ can do. Point number three, we find in verse 15 and 16. It says this, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. So Paul uses the term one body. This is the same language that he used when he wrote to the Corinthians at the church of Corinth. And it's found again in a letter in chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 12, he says this, For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. And then if you skip down to verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ, an individual member of it. So again, Paul is talking here about disunity among the body of Christ. And he even says, if you have a grievance among you and another brother, that you are to go to that person, you are to seek forgiveness, just as Christ has forgiven you. And then we see the words, that the term he uses is the word of Christ. And what this is referring to, what Paul is saying here, is he's talking about the teachings of Jesus and the words of Christ himself. I've been reading from the the Christian Standard Bible. However, some other translation uses it this way, and this helps me. Let me look at it a little bit differently. It says, let the message about Christ dwell richly among you. There needs to be unity in the body of Christ. And we find this unity modeled in the words, the actions, the teaching, and ultimately the example of Jesus. However, we won't find unity unless we are first in the word of God. Like I said earlier, the word of God is active. The word of God is alive. The Bible, in a very literal way, in a very literal way, this is God communicating to you. This isn't just a collection of of words on a piece of paper printed and, and bound. This is literally God speaking to us. And we need to be reading his word that is spoken through his written word. This is why at the beginning of the service, I say, we want to put a Bible in your hands if you don't have one. This is why you need to bring your Bible to church and read along with us. This is why I have so many scriptures that I referenced in here. God has already said it once through somebody else, and and I'm not going to be able to top it. So the best thing that I can do is say what's already been said by reciting scriptures. And this is why when I pray, I ask God, Lord, speak through me. Then use the scriptures from this Bible. Listen, these might not all be for you, but one of them might be. And then the other one is going to be for the person that's sitting next to you. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, The words were found, and I ate them. And your word became to me the gladness and the joy of my heart. We need to put this word inside of us. 
We need to, to meditate and marinate on this, and, and it needs to be inside of us. Walking point number three, final walking point. Very simple. You need to be reading your Bible. I said it earlier, and if I've said it once, I'm going to say it a hundred times. If you don't have a Bible, please, please let us give you one. Last week, Pastor Michael spoke, about, spoke to us about committing to a Bible reading plan. Um, in your bulletin, like Pastor Craig pointed out, you'll have one of these, one of these uh, cards right here. It has a, a series of Bible reading plans on the back of it. You can go to our website. We have a whole part of our website that has a couple Bible reading plans. You go to the, the um, YouVersion, the Bible uh, app on your phone, YouVersion, and there's hundreds, pr- probably thousands of Bible reading plans, everywhere from three, four, five-day reading plans to, to read the Bible in a whole year, read the, the New Testament in a whole year. One of my favorite was the F260 Bible reading plan. Remarkably so, and I don't think this is any coincidence, there's 260 weekdays in the year, and there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. And it's a chapter every day for the days of the week, and then you have the weekend to catch up. And then in one year, you'll read through the whole New Testament. I made up a Bible reading plan. It's called the Dave Ramsey Bible Reading Snowball Plan. (laughs) Dave Ramsey, in his debt snowball, you pay off your smallest debt first. So in my Bible reading plan, you read the smallest verse first. John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. (laughs) You've just now started a Bible reading plan. Congratulations. In In all seriousness, though, in all seriousness, that's what happens, though. You start reading. You just get this word in your head, in your heart, in your soul and your spirit, and it just continues to snowball from there. Your desire grows, and you realize that God is speaking. You, you realize that God is speaking to you through his word. We will help you find a Bible that you can read. This was interesting. Listen to this. Did you know that each of the different Bible translations is written in a different grade level? It's fascinating. The King James Version, and I want to be very, very clear about something. I am not discounting the King James Version or knocking it at all. When I study, I I will reference the King James Version. But the King James is written at a 12th grade reading level. And I use it a lot to study. But if I'm just reading either in a Bible reading plan or I'm just reading, I read in the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. It's written in a seventh grade reading level. There's also different translation methods. There are word-for-word translations and there are thought-for-thought translations. A lot of time when I study, I have an interlinear Bible with me. And what the interlinear is, it's a literal Hebrew to English, Greek to English. It is a literal word for word. But again, when I'm going through and I'm just reading, I'm going to read the CSB, which leans more towards a thought for thought translation. And what it does is it just helps me understand. Listen, I want to go back and I want to look at just each of these walking points one more time. And again, maybe, maybe they're for you. Maybe they're for the person next to you. Number one, walking point number one that we can leave here with. You need to ask God... If you need to refocus your life, are you focusing on earthly things or things that are above? Walking point number two, why would God want to restore you? Because he made you and he wants you to know him. Walking point number three, you need to be reading your Bible. As we close, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up probably the most important principle about this passage This entire passage is very important, but there is one part that if you're not really looking at it, you might miss it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So if you have been raised with Christ. Paul is writing to those who have been raised and have surrendered their lives to Christ. Those who have put their whole heart, their whole hope, and their whole trust in him. And if you're here today and you have never decided to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, I have the absolute best news that we could ever get in this new year. You can give your heart to him today. And what's going to happen when you do that 
is you will not be renewed. You will be made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. I want to invite the worship team up. And as they come up, I have two invitations for us today. The first invitation is this. If you are in Christ and you need to renew your relationship with him, you're ready to put to death the things of the earth and you're ready to put on the things that are of God. Our prayer team will be up here. I would like to invite the prayer team up here. And you can come up and pray or you can make a seat, you can make an altar right at your seat. Just don't leave this place without declaring to the Lord that you desire to be made new. The second invitation is this. If you are here and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you may know the name of Jesus, you may have been coming to church your entire life, but you have never told Jesus, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior, and I want you to save me. Then I, I want you to pray. And I want you to declare that today. Again, our prayer team is up here. We want to celebrate with you. Or you can write in your seat. You can make an altar in your seat. New Year's resolutions to get fit, to save money, to read a book, spend more time as a family. Those, those are fantastic. I'm not discounting a single one of those. However, declaring that the Lord, Jesus, is the Lord of your life, and making that resolution is the best resolution that you can make. Father God, I just want to thank you for your word. Lord, we know your word is alive. Your word speaks to us. Your word transforms us. Your word changes us. And your word renews us. So in the next few moments, Lord, do a work in our hearts. Renew us, or Lord, make us new. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.